share. <clears throat> uh, okay, folks. Um, let's see. Uh, can you see this okay? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. All right, so today um, the plan is to discuss time-dependent perturbation theory as a continuation of our discussion that we started last time um, before the midterm. Um, and so um, let's see. Um, OK, so to motivate this whole topic, there's this one problem that I really want everyone to understand or try to understand, which is what happens when you shine light on something. That's kind of like the, the motivational problem. But there's other pro problems as well. But here's an atom. And I'm stuck here in some state. These are my eigenstates of the unperturbed eigenstates of the atom with their ener eigen energies, unperturbed eigen energies, etc. <clears throat> and I'm sitting there in that state. And then I and then the little man has his laser and he shoots laser beam at that atom. And that laser beam has frequency h bar omega and you know, the, the light is an oscillating electric field. And we want to know then what happens. All right, that's the whole point. What happens? It's the main question in physics. And so um, we have a, we, we, we know that we have some perturbation, um, which is a time dependent perturbation due to the electric field, which is equal to the charge times the electric field, which is the force, right? Force times distance. So force times distance, there you have it. Force times distance. But of course, there's a little oscillating part too because the electric field is oscillating in time. So that's the, that's the perturbation. Um, and we can write it sort of more accurately saying it's equal to, for an electron, it's gonna be uh, E, uh, the electric, the light is going to come crashing down on it, and it's going to dot into the uh, location. Uh, I say R hat. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I got to get this right. A dot R. Okay. Um, all right. And so then to solve this. <clears throat> Then to, to figure out what's going on, what we did was we um, we said, well, let's use perturbation theory. And so we'll assume um, that it's not really an assumption. This is pretty good. We, we just will break up the problem. We'll say that the Hamiltonian is equal to our old uh, unperturbed Hamiltonian. You have a question? Um, plus the perturbation. Uh, that's our perturbation. That's and and then we know that the old Hamiltonian we know just fine. That's always that's always the assumption um, that we know the old Hamiltonian just fine. We know these. We know the states and we know the energies of the old Hamilton, you know, of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. And so then what we do is we, um, we assume, this is actually not an assumption. This is just a, I would say this is a starting point. Now we can start our assumptions. So let's, let's start with this assumption. We can assume that the, and, and this is still actually quite general. It's not really, it's an assumption, but not really an approximation. Um, we can assume that we can write the wave function as a, a linear superposition 
of all the unperturbed states. And each of those unperturbed states has its own time dependence like normal, right? The normal time dependent phase factor. And, and, and so that's it. But then we say, but that's what would happen in the absence of H prime, but because we have the H prime, we have to add a new factor, C n of T. And that's the most important thing. So that gets a big star, this factor. And so that, because this is, it means that we have some additional time dependence. <clears throat> additional time dependence to the occupation of the nth state. Don't sneeze, come on. Thanks. <laughs> so we have this additional time dependence and that's the most important thing. So I just wanna say that this C N of T is the most important thing. And the reason I say that is because I can ask you, what's the probability to be in state N at time T is equal to what? And this is, and now I'm asking a question, what is it? What's the probability that I find myself in the nth state at time T? On C N squared? Exactly. That's exactly right. It's going to be C N of T squared. And that's easy to see because you just overlap the wave function psi of X T onto phi of N and square it. And then you're going to get that uh, C N of T. And so clearly get, finding this C N of T is the most important thing. Um, and so the question then is how do we find C N of T? And to, to find C N of T, then what we do is we just plug, and we did this last time, so this is review, but we just plug our, our assumed form of the wave function into the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation now is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. The time dependent Schrodinger equation. And so that is going to be uh, um, H psi is equal to IH bar DDT psi. That's the Schrodinger equation, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So we just plug it into that. And we did that last time. And so we plugged it into that. And then we did some algebra. And after you do some algebra, then you get this equation, which is where we sort of left off last time. Uh, let me find that equation. The equation is, uh, <clears throat> we see that the time derivative of CM of T, and it doesn't matter whether it's a, the subscript is an N or an M. We just did M, uh, it's convenient to do an M for this equation, uh, is equal to negative I over H bar, uh, times, you know, instead of saying negative i over h bar, I'm just gonna write it a little differently. It, I can put, I can call that one over i h bar, because one over i is the same as negative i. So uh, one over i h bar, sum over n, all the unperturbed states, unperturbed states, uh, and then we have this matrix element of the per perturbation that connects the nth state to the mth state. It's a function of time times e to the negative i e n minus e m uh, t over h bar c n of t. Okay, so I would say that this is really the main central equation for uh, time dependent perturbation theory. So I'll just call that the central equation. I don't think other people call it that, but I'll call it that. It's a central equation of time dependent perturbation theory, TDPT. Um, 
Okay, and 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 so basically we just so to find C N of T, then all we got to do is solve this. All right, that's what we got to do. But of course, and that's what we're going to do. But to do that, we're then going to make a bunch of approximations. Uh, but before going on and doing all those approximations, I want you just to kind of admire this formula because I know that when you first look at this formula, it's just kind of a big mess, just a bunch of gobbledygook. Because I remember when I took this class as an undergrad, uh, I took this class in 19, uh, 1983. So that was 38 years ago that I, that I first saw this equation. And so I remember what it, I remember looking at it and it, it's not a very intuitive equation when you see it for the first time. But I do want, um, I want to sort of spend a few minutes just talking about this equation and kind of into the intuition, what it means before diving into more algebra and deriving a bunch more equations. It's worth it just to try to understand what it's talking about. And so uh, let's see where to begin. The first thing to begin is just to realize that this equation is actually, it looks so complicated, but it's actually kind of simple in a way because it's sort of like, there's like a simple way to sort of uh, unpiece this equation. Like for example, what we can do is we can say to ourselves, well, um, if psi, if psi of xt is equal to the sum of c m of t uh, phi n of x e to negative i e n of t over h bar, the, uh, which is a sum over all the unperturbed states, then what we can do is we can say, well, the if if I want to know the rate of change of this factor c m of t, then kind of intuitively you can think of it like this. That's going to be equal to the overlap of that. That's the component in the mth state c m of t. So that's going to so you can think of that as like the overlap of this, the time dependence of the whole wave function. Does that kind of make sense? The time rate of change of, of CM of T, because that's the probability to be in the mth state. You know, that's gonna, that's, well, it's like the square root of the probability to be in the mth state. Um, a little twiddly there. Um, so, you know, so if I take the time derivative of the whole wave function, just overlap it onto that, then that kind of, I think that's kind of intuitive. That it kind of makes sense that that's the C M of T. But then if I do this, then um, we can now just unpack it because that this, this for this part right here is just going to be phi M times E to the plus I E M T over H bar because it's a bra and then ddt but what's ddt well ddt is just going to be one over i h bar times h because remember the the schrodinger equation is h psi equals i h bar ddt psi and so that means that ddt the operator is like um one over i h bar h See these two these two things do the same thing. Like the the time derivative is the same as one over i h bar h. So that means that here I have the time operator, the time derivative, and I can just multiply it, replace it by one over i h bar h. And then psi of x t, of course, is going to be just the sum n um, c n of t phi n of t e to the negative i e and t over h bar. And then you just put it all together and you have it. D, D, T, C, M of T is equal to, pull, pull everything out and you have the sum over N and then you have this uh, by M, I think that's the h prime, h prime um, by N, um, and then you have e to the negative i e n minus e m t over h bar. Uh, and you have the one over i h bar in the front. And then you have uh, 
Then the last thing is just the C N of T. And, and that's exactly the equation that we derived. I, I just want you to see that this is the same thing because this is H prime M N. So I'm trying to just give you a little, I'm trying to unpack that formula just to show you that the formula is actually very logical and kind of makes sense. It, you know, I want it to like, not just be a bunch of gobbledygook to you. Okay, so that's, that's just sort of to see that the formula kind of makes sense, you know? Um, and so now, but it's still a kind of complicated looking formula, but and so how do we actually interpret it? Well, the reason, so this formula, could you, yeah. Could you clarify what the 5M and 5N are? I got kind of lost there. Yeah, yeah. Um, let, me, let me do it this way. What I'm just about to do. So let me, so let me try to do it. Let me try to answer your question a, a different way and tell me if this answers your question or not. Yeah, thank uh, you. So, <clears throat> because what I want to do is just try to interpret this equation. Like, what is this equation telling us? And so this is, and so the thing that realizes it's saying, if I have some state, the nth state, then the rate of change of this factor C depends on all the other states, because this is a sum over all the states, right? And so what does that mean? How do we understand this uh, intuitively? <laughs> okay, this is how you understand it. This is a way to think of it. This is how I, th I think of it, which I think is a nice way to think about it. But I mean, you, know, you might develop your own way uh, as time goes on, but this is a nice way to start. Let's think of all the energy levels of the atom or state or box or whatever it is, all the states, all the unperturbed states. And, and they have, you know, they're one, they have an index, three, four, blah, blah, blah. And then there's an mth one. And then this is m plus one, m plus two, m plus three, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this whole, all these states. Now we're talking about this equation right here, the equation that gets, a, that gets the two stars, the central equation. It's talking about the time derivative of C m of t. And so we're talking about this state right here. And so I'm gonna give each of these states a little bit of stuff, stuff. What am I giving them? What is this stuff that I'm giving them? Let's say that every one of these states gets a little bit of stuff. It has like a little, it's like a ledge in your kitchen, you know, like a shelf and I'm putting some stuff on the shelf. What is that stuff? Well, this stuff, I'm gonna call it amplitude. And what the hell is amplitude? Well, probability is the square of amplitude. So you can think of amplitude as a square root of probability, although that's not quite right because amplitude can be complex and probability is real. So, you know, there's a little bit of information lost in that translation, but still bear with me. Every one of these states gets some amplitude and probability is amplitude squared. And so what, what is the, this amplitude, what that amplitude is, that's the CN of T. And so this is, and so this is how you should think about it. It's like the state psi is equal to this mess of stuff because your wave function is a linear superposition of all of these different states. And each state gets some amplitude. And the amplitude is this CN of T. And that's telling you how much of your state is in, how much of your total wave function is in that particular state. And it's basically the probability to find yourself in that state. And this is a really important way of looking at it because remember that the total probability is normalized because if I sum all the CN of all the CNs together, what do I get? One. Oh, yes. So this is so this stuff is conserved. CN of T, this stuff, this amplitude is a conserved quantity. And that means there's a finite amount of it. It doesn't, it's neither created nor destroyed. Um, 
And so basically the, what's happening is that as time goes on, what the time dependent Schrodinger equation is doing is it's just rearranging the amplitude. The CNFT stuff just gets rearranged. It just gets squished around through between all of these different states. It's just squishing around. And how, did, how does it squish around? Well, how it squishes around is this equation. This equation tells us how it squishes around. And so I like to think of this amplitude in my mind as I like to think of it as like stuff, like fluid. And I think that that makes it more real and more intuitive. So think of this. So when I say this CM of T, don't just think of it as just like some weird equation, CM of T. Think of it as probability fluid. It's fluid, it's stuff, it's amplitude, and it has a color. It's green. In my mind, it's green. It's like gooey. It's kind of viscous. Like, uh, you know, like, uh, like okra that's been cooked a little too long in the gumbo, you know, it gets that green, snotty sort of consistency. That's what I have. That's how I picture this stuff. It's like green goo. All right. And it's so I think it really helps to understand quantum mechanics if you start sort of visualizing it as like a real thing, because probability is a real thing. It's a conserved quantity. And so in quantum mechanics, you have to really think of it as like this stuff. It's not like you're the, it's not like the way you think of probability normally when you take a statistics class. In quantum mechanics, the probability is more like a fluid, like a stuff, and it gets moved around. It gets shifted between states. Okay, so so here, look at this picture. Yeah, There's yeah. No connection though to probability current whatsoever. Yeah, it, the, that, that connection is a little looser because probability current is more like uh, a property of the wave function, a function of space. You know, we will talk about probability current, but, uh, but here there's no uh, movement in space yet. You see what I'm saying? So probability current is like a movement in space of probability, like it literally flows in space. So probability current is, is how is basically saying how fast does the probability flow like water in space, <laughs> you know, but notice how in these equations, uh, there's no movement in space yet. So yeah, so it's not exactly the same, but it's re it's related. And, and that's why I'm using this imagery and these words, because I want you to remember your probability current discussions from last semester. And I want you to sort of build these new discussions on top of those old discussions. All right, because we're, we're trying to build up a uh, intuition for quantum mechanics. So this is like, so this, Sorry, yeah. Can I ask a question? So when you say like the probability is uh, conserved, you mean the sum of all the CN squared is conserved, right? But each individual CN squared is changing over time, right? Just clarify that. Yes, that's the key. That's the key concept. That's the whole point because, and because the amount of this probability amplitude is flowing from one state to the other. It's moving, it's flowing. And, and how does it flow? Well, that's what this equation is telling us. This big equation that we just derived is simply telling us how that probability amplitude flows from one state to the next. That's what this is, DDT CM of T. That's the rate of change of this probability fluid, of this stuff, this green goo. So, so this is how to think about it. Um, so, so what we, so we're talking about the nth state right here. <clears throat> so let's draw all the states again, here they all are. Now let's just focus on the one state M. Now he has some amplitude, his C M of T, right? He's got his green goo, his little packet of goo. How much probability amplitude is living in that state? He has it. Now let's consider all the other states. State one, two, three, four, all the other states, six, all of them, you know, n goes to infinity. Now each of these states has its amplitude, right? Now, what happens is if there was no perturbation, what do you think would happen to those amplitudes? If there, if there was no perturbation, each of these, each of these um, states has some amplitude because remember the, the wave function is equal to the sum of all of those guys. <coughs> the, so I'm, I'm actually asking you a question. 
if there was no perturbation, what, what would happen to all of this green goo, this probability fluid amplitude that's living inside of each one of these states? What would it do? They're if there was constants. no perturbation? What? They're just constants, right? Yes. It would just sit there. It might quiver like a little bowl of jello. It would quiver and just sit there, but it would not change. It would not move from one state to the other because these are eigenstates. And remember the probability in an eigenstate doesn't change. That's why we call it a stationary state. So the green goo in all of those states, the amount of amplitude in each one of those states would just be constant in time because the wave function is unchanging except for some global phase factor, which we're not gonna get all uh, worried about. Um, but now what we do is we turn on the perturbation, turn on H prime, which can, has a time dependence. Now we turn on a perturbation. What does that perturbation do physically? And I, I'm, I'm not saying don't, don't spot equations at me. Tell me what, what happens to the, all that amplitude once I turn on the perturbation. Those amplitudes get gets rearranged, right? Exactly. They start flowing. Amplitudes start shifting from one state to another. I want you to picture it as like this. They're sharing fluids. You know, they're sharing fluids. I hope they're doing it safely. And so the fluid is just moving from one level to the next between all of them. And so that and that's a dance that's occurring due to the Schrodinger equation. So, you know, the Schrodinger equation, like why is, this, is the fluid shared? It's because of the Schrodinger equation. That's the solution of the Schrodinger equation is that fluid being shared between the states. The green goo is being shared from one to the next. Okay, so, so that's all starts happening. But now let's just focus on this one state, the M state. So basically what that means is that once I turn on the perturbation, every one of these states starts sharing its fluid with the M state. And he shares his fluid with them too. So if I like look at this state, like this is, you know, N equals, you know, 10, 23, you know, the 1,000 23rd state. Well, whatever amplitude is in that state, whatever green goo is in that state, it starts getting shared with the nth state. But how about this guy? Yeah, he shares too. And how about this guy? Oh yeah, he's doing it. Oh yeah, him too. They're all doing it. They're all sharing their fluid with this nth state. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the nth state, the amount of fluid the nth state has is gonna change in time. And that's this, see, I'm circling it right here. See how I'm circling that? That's the nth state. So his amount of fluid is changing in time. Why is it changing in time? It's changing in time because all the states, see what I'm underlining? All the states are giving it some of their fluid because see, this is their fluid right here, CNFT right here, I'm circling it. So they're all giving some of their probability fluid to him. How much of their probability fluid are they giving to him? Well, it depends on these relative phase factors. I got that phase factor, and then I also have this time-dependent perturbation. So there's really, there's really three time scales here because I have the rate of change of the probability fluid in the nth state. And that's gonna go as, I have the I have the the phi m of t. I have the h, and then I have the other states phi n of t. There's three time scales. Ah, that that was meant to be phi m of t, because I'm basically overlapping the other state onto the phi m of t, and what's causing it, what's causing it to overlap is the Hamiltonian. So there's going to be three. So there's uh, there's going to be three time scales here, and it's very natural. Three natural time scales. It's going to be. Let me try to write this more clearly. Yeah, I got the Hamiltonian, and I got the other state that's connecting to it. And this guy has a natural time scale e to the negative i, um, uh, e m t. He has a phase factor that's 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 spinning. So that's a phase factor that's spinning at some frequency omega. Zoom, 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 zoom. Whenever someone so, says e to the i e m t over h bar, that's a spinning phase factor. 
So that state has a natural time scale. He's spinning at some frequency. The frequency he's spinning at is his energy, right? It's just E M over H bar because energy is a frequency. Now this state also has its own natural time scale and that's E to the negative I E N T over H bar. And then this guy is has its frequency of whatever is the frequency of the Hamiltonian. So I'm sorry, I'm not running this very clearly, but I want you to see that th these three time scales are determining the rate at which the fluid is being exchanged between the state we're talking about, phi m, and, and some other arbitrary state. That is what is in this equation. This equation is just, is just uh, keeping track of how every single state is exchanging fluid with the state we're talking about. And the fluid is probability fluid, okay? So that, that's, what's, that's the picture here. So I'm sorry for going on about that, but I want you to, I think, I just want you to see that there's sort of intuitive physics behind these very uh, abstract equations. <clears throat> um, but you have to think about it. I know the first time you see it, it, it's a little confusing. So, okay. So let's, let's go back and let's, let's do some physics with this. So let, let, now it's time for us to solve. Let's, now let's solve the equation. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So the total energy is going to be like a sum of CN, CN of T times EN. Is wait, 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 not energy. I'm sorry. You're talking, let's talk about probability. We're talking about there's energy. Energy determines the frequency, okay? Energy determines how fast the phase factors spin around. That's where energy comes into play. And then there's amplitude and amplitude is this, and probability is the sum of all the amplitudes squared. So now ask your question. Uh, <laughs> I was just wondering, like, um, if it's like thinking in analogous to the previous um, ideas of like total energy, the energy is like sum of CN times EN. No, right? no, because oh, you're sorry. mixing, you're mixing energy and probability, you know, CN, uh -huh. you're, you're mixing energy and probability. They're, they're separate things. Energy is just like, see how this list, I have these lists here, like that's, that's one, right? It has energy one, that's two, it has energy two, that's three, it has energy three. Now, the energy of all these states just tells us how fast they spin around. So every one of these states has a little phase factor associated with it that's spinning at some frequency. This guy has one, this guy has one, they all have one. And the frequencies at which they spin is determined by the energy, e to the negative i, e, three, t over h bar. This guy is spinning at the rate e to the negative i, e, four, t over h bar. <clears throat> That's where energy comes in. Energy is just telling us how fast every state is spinning. That's all. The thing that's conserved that we add up is probability. That's this equation right here. Probability is the sum of all the amplitudes and that's conserved. So did, 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 I, did that address your question or do you want to ask your question again? Um, I was wondering if energy is still conserved. Um, thinking about conservation of energy is not helpful in the context of time dependent perturbation theory. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit, but thinking about energy conservation is not a helpful concept at this point. It's just, it just hasn't come into play. All right. What's what's okay. more helpful is thinking of conservation of probability, okay. because it's the fluid, the probability fluid that's being exchanged. The energy just tells us how quickly it gets exchanged, how fast they're throwing it. Poop, 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 poop. You know, they're they're throwing it back and forth, and the speed at which it's being exchanged is are these determined by these these uh, phase factors, these rotating phase factors. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. So now we're going to solve this equation. Um, so let's think of it like this. So, so let's go back to our original picture. And now in the context of this new visualization, let's go back and let's reimagine what's happening. And so here we are, this is our box. We're living in some box. Let's assume that we're here in this state, the kth state, all right? And now I'm gonna, sh now I'm gonna uh, shine some light on it or I'm gonna perturb it. 
This would be my h prime of t. Um, now, we're going to start in the kth state. And, and what does that mean to start in the kth state? And then, of course, we're going to shine, we're going to hit it with the perturbation. Uh, hit with h prime at t equals zero. And then the question, of course, is the central question of physics what happens? Okay, we're gonna ask what happens. So, so this is the picture. So, so now picture all the unperturbed states and there's an infinite number of them. And here's K and here's K plus one and blah, 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 all the way up to infinity. So that's all the states, the unperturbed states. So now this particle is starting in the kth state. So that means I'm gonna give him some green goo some probability fluid right there. Um, how much does he get? Uh, C K at T equals zero squared equals what? Somebody tell me. So one. That's exactly right. Cause that means, that's what it means to start in the kth state. It means that C k of t equals zero is one exactly or this thing squared that's right so he gets up so he basically is a hog he's a hog he got all the green goo for himself how much green goo did this guy get state number three how much amplitude does he get c3 at t equals zero is equal to what tell me zero that's exactly right he doesn't get any because all the green goo got gobbled up by this kth guy. So these guys don't have any green goo. Okay, so, but now I'm gonna turn on the light. And now this particle, which starts in the k state, it's gonna start having possibilities to transition up and down. <clears throat> this particle is now gonna have a probability to transition to all these different states, both up and down. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that I have all these, all the states, I'm gonna rewrite them right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 blah. So when I turn on the perturbation, turn on H prime of T, that means that green goo is gonna start being sprayed. He's gonna start spraying his goo everywhere. He's indiscriminate. And he's spraying his green goo to every state. He wants to pass it around, he wants to share it. He wants to share it with everyone. Um, that's what he does. He's spraying his green goo everywhere. That means he's, he's giving his probability to everyone else. He's giving them probabilities. Say, here, take it, take it, it's yours. He's spraying his probability. And these guys are then starting to accumulate green goo. They started with none. <clears throat> At t equals zero, the other states had no <clears throat> green goo. They had no probability of occupation, but now he's giving them his probability. He's giving them his amplitude. So they're starting to accumulate amplitude. Now let's pick an arbitrary state and let's ask ourselves how much amplitude does some arbitrary state accumulate? So let's pick one. Let's call it M. Let's pick this arbitrary state that I'm gonna call the Mth state. M, the nth state. And I'm gonna ask the question, how much probability does he accumulate at time t? And he's getting it from the kth state because I started in the kth state. So I'm just picking some arbitrary state <clears throat> and I'm saying, how much of the green goo from the kth state is being sprayed your way? And that's a very relevant question because that is the same as saying, what is the probability that the particle has made a transition to the nth state? What's the probability? This is the probability to be in the nth state at t not equal to zero. It's this. And 
what is what is the equation here? It equals what? <clears throat> cm of t squared. Exactly. So this whole question of <clears throat> this whole question of, of how much green goo gets sprayed into the nth state is very important because it tells us what's the probability that the particle is literally in the nth state. And, and this is the same as, and so this is another way of saying this is that this is equal to <clears throat> the probability to have a transition to the nth state. So this is the transition probability. So, you know, how much green goo gets sprayed into the nth state is the transition probability. So it's very important. Okay, and so let's calculate it. So we know our little formula. We have this big formula here. There it is. It's this big formula where it has two stars. The central formula from time-dependent perturbation theory. And so, um, where is it? Let's just, okay, I'm just gonna write it out. D, D, T, C, M of T um, is equal to one over I H bar, the sum of H prime M N of T, E to the negative I, E M minus, oops, uh, E N minus E, M T over H bar uh, C N of T, C N of T. Okay, that's the central equation that we derived. In fact, I derived it two different ways. Um, so now let's, but now let's apply it to this particular problem. So look, this is a sum over all the states. Now at T equals zero, uh, at T equals zero, what is this value of CN of T for all the states? At T equals zero, what are all one, those? One. For, it's one for which one? It is one for which one? The K state. Exactly. C K of T equals zero equals one. What is CN not equal to K at T equals zero equal to? Tell me. Zero. Yes. So that means that if I'm talking about a very short amount of time, how much green goo has this guy, this is the picture here on the left, you know, it's right here on your page on the left. How much green goo has the K state sprayed into all these other states over a very short amount of time? Tell me. A lot or a little? That's all I need to know. A lot or a little? Very little over a short time scale. Exactly. So over a very short time scale, if I'm talking about the green goo coming into the nth state, do I have to worry about that green goo coming from all those other states other than the kth one? Do I have to worry about them? Yes or no? No. That's right. Now, in a perfect world, if I was being really exact, I would have to worry about them. Because remember, all of these guys are sharing their fluid. They're all spraying it. And so as soon as the kth state gives like the n equals four state, some green goo, then the n equals four state is gonna share its green goo. It's gonna say, oh, I got some, I'm gonna, <laughs> it's a food fight. It's a food fight. The time dependent, the time dependent Schrodinger equation is really just a food fight. It's just causing, it just means that the amplitude is just getting sprayed everywhere. And so that means that the M state is, is getting contributions from every other state. But the point is, is that if all the amplitude started in the kth state, then over a very short amount of time, all the other states only have very little to share. So I don't I can ignore them. So that means that this, that this sum, I can forget about the sum and I only have to worry about which state in that sum. Tell me. K state. That's exactly right. K state. That's exactly right. So now the sum, 
So now I've just really simplified the problem. So now the time rate of change of the amplitude in the nth state is equal to one over i h bar and uh, h prime m. Now I only care about how the nth state is coupled to the kth state. That's the initial state. And then uh, this is a function of time. And then I have e to the negative i. And I only have to worry about the kth state, the initial state, and how that is coupled to the nth state, t over h bar. And this cn of t, I only have to worry about ck of t, how the, c okay? And so now, um, um, and so now let's go even a little further. Now, the, let's consider ck of t. Now, at time t equals zero, ck of t is one, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? because all the amplitude starts in the kth state, that's the initial state. Now, if I only worry about a little tiny amount of time, a short time, how much of the green goo has left the kth state? A lot or a little? Little. Yeah, only a tiny amount. He, Cause he wants to spray his green goo everywhere. You know, he's in the food fight. He enjoys food fights and he wants to throw his green goo everywhere and splash it around, but he has not had much time. So he's only had time to throw a little bit of his green goo. And so he's still sitting on a big pile of green goo. And so that okay, means, yeah. All right, so I'm a little confused because if the kth state um, like loses only a little bit of this goo, right? Um, like at early times and like a deep, like say like a differential amount of time, then wouldn't that mean we can't ignore like all the other end states? because there's still so much goo that will eventually like evolve over time and spread to the other end states. Um, and, then, and then it, like, like you said, it becomes a food fight, but I thought we could ignore all the other terms because like uh, the K, the K state is like spewing this goo to the M states. Um, well, like the, que the question is who is spraying the most goo? Who is spraying it the most? because the rate at which you spray it is proportional to how much you have, right? Because look at the little formula. See how the CN of T is in the formula? The rate at which you spray it depends on how much you have. So the, the K state has a ton of it. So he's spraying it like a fire hose, you know, at everyone. He had, he's spraying it the most. All the other guys only have a tiny, tiny amount. So for a short time, even though they are accumulating it from the K state, they have so little that when they spray it, it's just a little baby trickle. That's why we ignore them. But the K gotcha. state, okay? Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, so now let's look at the C K of T. So if the K state is sitting on this big pile of green goo and it's spraying it, but over a short period of time, it's only been able to spray a little bit. How much, it's like a dragon's horde. How much has the dragon's horde changed? If the dragon just is sitting on a big pile of gold and just throws a few coins, you know, most of that horde is still there. So the K state still has most of his green goo, you know, even though he's, he's spraying it, he can't spray it fast enough. He still has it. And so what I can do is I can say that CK of T is approximately what? What approximation will we make based on the description that I just made? One. Yes, that's exactly right. We're gonna make the approximation that over a short period of time, the amount of green goo that the K-state have is unchanged. So now we'll just take this and we'll just say that that's equal to one. And, and so now what we've done is we've made our equation incredibly simple. D D T C M of T equals one over I H bar H prime M K of T E to the negative I E K minus E M T over H bar. And the approximation that we've made is that it's over a short time. Small time, small T. And now we've made it so simple that we can actually, and, and th those are approximations. So now we've made it so simple that we can actually solve it because it's like so trivial now. Uh, how do we solve this equation? 
C M of T equals what? Somebody tell me, solve it. How do we solve this equation? Use your math skills and solve it. Tell Integrate me. Integrate with respect to T on both sides. That's it, exactly. That's exactly right. It's uh, one over I H bar integral from zero to T of H prime M K. And now I have to integrate with respect to T prime, E to the negative I, E K minus E M of T prime over H bar D T prime. There you have it. We just solved for C M of T. We solved that equation. It looks so hard. Look how hard that equation looked. Let's go back to it. It's this equation with the two stars, the central equation of time dependent perturbation theory. And we just solved it. It's just so simple. Okay, it, it, it reduced to this very simple thing based on these uh, simple assumptions that we have made. <clears throat> and the That's most, right. yeah. Um, about the assumption that we made when we say um, C of K is equal to one, isn't it true only when T is very close to zero, so like right after zero, but like over time, other states are going to also accumulate their green gooey things. <laughs> That's um, right. So how can we make that assumption over the lo long period of time? It starts to fall apart, okay? It goes bad. You're totally right. So this, this, this treatment is not good over a long time period. So then you have to make different assumptions. It depends, it's, it's gonna be a case by case basis. Okay. And, and, and that's just the way it is, you know, cause it, it, so I guess the, my answer to you is it depends on the details, <laughs> okay? But, but what we want to do is we want to, uh, we want to consider a treatment right now that does not depend on the details, okay? So for short, at short time periods, it doesn't depend on the details. There's like this very general behavior. And so that's, but this question of what is a short period of time is a little bit uh, ambiguous. You know, what does it mean to be a short period of time? We can address that question a little bit. Um, oh, I just hate writing all these equations, so many of them. Uh, let's see, where are they? You know, we can address it. <clears throat> like for example, let's consider this, equation right here, this equation, let's just go back one step to this equation that I just put a star on. And, and let's, let's take the amplitude of both sides, okay? Let's take the, the amplitude of both sides, the magnitude, okay? Of, of the left side equals the magnitude of the right side. And let's then let's consider just a short, time okay and so then um i have um delta c m of t over delta t is equal to now if i take the absolute magnitude all of the complex i's just kind of turn into a one and so it becomes one over h bar times um, h prime m of k um, times um, c k of t, right? But the biggest that c k of t can be, the very, very biggest is one. So let's just call it, let's just say that that's approximately equal to H prime MK over H bar. So then let's just take this little sidebar of math and let's just notice then that I can say Delta C M of T is approximately equal to H prime um, over H bar um, times, that's the matrix on the MK times Delta T. D do you see that? I got that? I, I just brought the, I just brought the time over. So that, so now for the approximation to be whole, held, 
that means that there cannot be much green goo that has flowed. So that means that delta CM of T for a short time, I'm defining what a short time is. For a short time, delta CM of T is much less than what? Tell me. One. Yes, exactly. Because the biggest that the amplitude can be is one. So for a short period of time, it has to be way less than one. That's exactly right. And so that means then that for a short time, then this is delta CM of T. So that means that that thing, H prime M K over H bar delta T, it's gotta be less than one. That means then that delta T has to be less than H bar over H prime M K. Okay, I just defined what it means to be a short period of time. So I, I just wanted to do that for you, just so you get a sense of like, because when I say small time, what the hell does that mean? So this is what it means to be a small time. Okay, we just derived it. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, uh, okay. so now we have this beautiful expression for the, uh, yeah, for CM of T. This is the thing we wanted. So this guy gets four stars because this is the answer. This is like the main result. This is, I won't call this the central equation, but this is really the main result of time-dependent perturbation theories is this equation, because this is the equation that allows us to figure out the transition probability for any different physical system. So now let's use this and let's apply it to uh, a problem. Professor, let's, is there supposed to be a negative sign in the exponent uh, in this final answer here? Yeah, let's get that right. That's right, thank you. Good, okay, thank you. Uh, now let's apply it. So let's assume, let's make a simple assumption. Let's assume that uh, H prime of T equals a constant. And let's make the, let's just make, let's just say that it's a constant in time. So we're gonna make this assumption that and, and it, it, that we're gonna make this assumption that H prime looks like this. It's gonna be, as a function of time, it's gonna be zero, and then it's gonna turn on, and then it's gonna be constant. And it turns on at T equals zero, and then it's just constant. And then you, should, you can kind of think of it as turning off at time T. So this is, I'll call this the T prime axis, but this is, at time t, you kind of think of it as turning off. So this is how we're gonna have the, so this is our perturbation. We'll call this the constant perturbation. And you might say, well, what does that mean physically? Well, this is how you could think of it physically. Check this out. What if I had a capacitor and I had a, a battery and I had a switch and that's the other wire to my capacitor. And here I have my atom there's an electron like a hydrogen atom in, in a capacitor. And this is minus, this is plus, and this is a, uh, a capacitor. And then I just close that switch at T equals zero. And then suddenly that creates an electric field, right? Um, that points like this. And that electric field is constant. And then I could turn it off. You see what I'm saying? So I want to give you a sort of physical sense of what I'm actually talking about. So that's a, a, a constant perturbation that I turn on and off. Okay, and so then the question is, so I apply it, the, the perturbation, and then I ask the question, what is the probability? So then I ask the question, I say this, I say, I say, I say, if I'm initially in state K, then what is the probability to be in state M at time T? Okay, I'm asking you to calculate a transition probability. So basically I'm saying, here I am, here I am, I'm in some state K, and then I apply H prime to it. 
and then uh, I'm at, and then there's some state M, and I'm asking you what's the probability that I have a transition to the nth state. Okay, that's what I'm asking you. So um, you know the answer. The answer is that the probability to have transitions to the nth state is just going to be the probability amplitude of the nth state squared. How much green goo has accumulated in the nth state? That's the answer. How much goo has accumulated from the kth state? And we know the answer. It's going to be this thing because I know that it's this integral. So basically, the answer is then we have to basically do the integral, and then we got to square it, right? Do the integral and then square it. So let's do that. So there's the integral. I've written it up there. So um, let's let's do that integral, and. The thing is, is that when I do the integral, uh, look, guys, I need you to mute yourself. Somebody, uh, somebody's making a lot of noise. I need you guys to mute yourself if you're not talking. Um, okay, so, um, but if you, but if you want to say something, then unmute yourself. All right, so it's fine to interrupt me, but just don't make a lot of noise. Um, okay, so let's let's calculate that integral. <clears throat> So C M of T um, is, um, let's do the integral. It's, uh, it's gonna be equal to, um, how did I write it here? One over I h bar. It's gonna be one over I h bar time. And I can bring, because this part is constant, I can bring it out of the integral. So I can bring the perturbation outside, the, the matrix element outside h prime m of k becomes outside of the integral. And then I'm gonna do the integral from zero to t, uh, e to the negative i, um, e k minus e m t prime over h bar dt prime. Okay, that's the integral. And this is a pretty easy integral because you, you could actually do this integral. So this is not hard, it's, a, it's an exponent. And uh, exponents are easy, you all know how to do it. So I'll just write down the answer that you all could figure out. Uh, and that's gonna be equal to, um, it's equal to one over I h bar um, times h prime m times k times negative uh, h bar over I uh, times e to negative I e k minus e m t prime over h bar over e k minus e m from zero to time t. That's it, that's the integral. So let's just plug in these, uh, these limits. Um, and so when I plug in the limits, it's gonna give me um, those factors in front will cancel and it's gonna become h prime m k. <coughs> e to the negative i e k minus e m t over h bar. Uh, then, there'll be, then there'll be a minus one because of the zero. This guy, right, give us the minus one divided by e k minus e m. Okay, and so that's, that's c m of t, we calculated it. But now to get the probability, p, the probability to be in the m state, I gotta square that sucker. So I got to square this expression. And so now I'm going to take, I'm going to make use of a, um, I'm going to make use of a little trig identity. Let's use a little trig identity, which is this, that um, e to the minus i x minus one times um, e to the plus i x minus one is equal to two times one minus, uh, cosine x, which is equal to four times sine squared x over two. Okay, that's just a little trig identity. And I think that you can sort of see how this trig identity is gonna be useful for squaring this sucker. Okay, so when I square that sucker above, that trig identity will be useful. And so when I use that trig identity, then what I get is 
that the probability to be in the nth state at time t is going to be four times the uh, matrix element that connects the initial state with the final state. I just want to say that this is the final state. And then k is the initial state. So this is the language we use for time dependent processes. We say initial state, final state, but it's the same as the M and the K that we've been talking about uh, times sine squared uh, um, the difference between the energy of the uh, initial state and the final state times T over two H bar. times E K minus E M squared. Now, don't right. you want to square the H prime sub M K? I do. Thank you. Okay, so this is a big important result. This guy gets three stars. So that we just derived it. We just derived a very important result. This is one of the, this is, I would say this might even be the most important result from time dependent perturbation theory, uh, like the actual final result. Uh, and so let's try to figure out what this means. So this is basically the probability to make a transition. Okay, so we started, we started in this state, the k state, and we're asking ourselves, what is the probability that we go to the nth state, okay, under the influence of some perturbation? And this perturbation was turned on at t equals zero. So let's try to understand this. There's a lot going on in this equation. It was not hard to derive. Or, you know, we just did that integral and squared it. So it's actually, the math is pretty easy, but there's a lot of physics buried in the math. So let's, to understand what's going on here, let's plot this thing. Um, let's plot it. And let's plot it first as a function of time. So let's plot the probability to be in the nth state. We started in the kth state, and we wanted the, the probability to be in some arbitrary nth state. How much, basically, how much green goo has accumulated in the nth state at time t? Because it's really the accumulation of the green goo that determines the probability to be in that state. Okay, so let's plot it. So uh, that's a sine function. So I start at zero. Oh, and it's this thing squared, sorry. Um, so I start at zero and then uh, it oscillates. And it's a sine squared function, so it's oscillating like that. It oscillates, so that's actually really interesting to notice. And so that means that uh, at this time, and I'll just call this, uh, I don't know, I'll call this T1 at the, the probability to be in the state M at time T1 is a max. That's the maximum probability. That, so that's the most, so at that time, you have the highest probability of being in the nth state. Max probability to be in the nth state, phi sub M. But what about this? Let's call this T2. What is the probability to be in the nth state at T2? What is it? What is it? Tell me. Is it just zero? Yeah, it's zero. And now let's go here to T3. And then at T3, PM at T3, it's again a max. I mean, this is just obvious. This is just, you know, a sine function, right? So, you know, that's just what functions do. They go up and down. But the, but not, but the question then is, but what is the physics of it? You know, where's the physics? Where's the equation we started with? It's right here. Look, this is what I want you to see. It's like, <clears throat> see this thing, this equation? This is saying that the amount of amplitude in the M state, the green goo that has accumulated in the M state is equal to the accumulation of this integrand as over time. So 
this integral is an integral of the green goo. It's basically saying how much of the green goo is being sprayed at me and I'm just accumulating it. And the integral is just telling me how much I have accumulated over some time T. Now, what this answer is telling us is that my accumulate is that initially I started accumulating green goo. I'm, I'm accumulating it, I'm accumulating it, but then suddenly I start losing it, losing it, losing it, losing it. I'm back to zero. Then I start getting it again, getting it, getting it, getting it, losing it, losing it, losing it. How does that happen? How is that expressed in this integral? What is happening in this integral that is causing me to have my probability go back to zero? Well, it's the uh, phase factor with the e to the minus i e sub k minus e sub m. Is exactly, that... exactly. Because the thing that the thing that you have to appreciate is that I have the mth state and I have my initial state k. Now my mth state has a phase factor that's spinning with some frequency omega is equal to e m over h bar. And my kth state also has a phase factor that is spinning with some frequency. And that frequency is omega equals e k uh, over h bar. And the, and the rate at which the green goo is being sprayed is the product of these phase factors. And so what that means is that sometimes I get the green goo, but sometimes I give it back. That's the key point you have to understand. This is a food fight where the green goo is going back and forth, but who, who gets the green goo depends on these relative phase factors. Sometimes the product of the phase factors is positive, which means I get the green goo, but sometimes the product is negative, which means I'm giving it back, all right? So it's really a sharing of the green goo. These people, you know, the green, you know, people are very, these states are very, uh, what's the word, you know, they're very fair, you know, they take it, but they give it back too. You're not too greedy. Uh, okay, so, I, but I want you to see, so, so I'm getting amplitude from the initial state, but then I'm giving it back. And that's why my probability is oscillating because I'm getting a lot of green goo, but then I'm giving it all away, then I'm getting it back. So there's this funny dance. And from a physics perspective, what that means is that the particle is jumping back and forth. A way to picture that is that as the probability goes back and forth, back and forth, you can actually think of the particle as like moving back and forth. And so we sometimes give that a word. We sometimes call that a, a, a Rabi oscillation, Rabi oscillation. Okay, Rabi oscillation. So that's a really important thing to notice. Uh, then let's keep going though. So now let's plot the, the now let's plot the function. So that's the function, it's this sine squared over squared thing. Let's plot it again. Let's plot it. Um, oh, I hate that I have to keep rerunning it. Uh, let's plot it again. So it's it's uh, c m of t squared is equal to four h prime m k squared sine squared um, e k minus e m t over two h bar um, e k minus e m squared. Okay, uh, <clears throat> now let's plot it differently. Now let's plot it as a function of energy. C m uh, squared uh, as a function of energy of the final state. And let's start here with the energy of the initial state. Okay, so if I plot that, then notice that this function, I want you to notice that it, it looks kind of like this, sine squared uh, kx over x squared. You see that? It has a, it's a very distinctive sort of, uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I got it right, yeah. That, you see the functional, the function of that, that's the function that, 
It's like sine squared kx over x squared. Can you can you see that? So that's a very um, famous function. Do you guys know what it, what that looks like? Do you guys remember? Like sine x over x, sine x over x. It's a very famous function. Do you guys remember what it looks like? Can someone tell me? I think it even has a name. They call it sync like sync or something, I can't remember too well. Uh, okay, it's a diffraction pattern. It's the famous diffraction pattern. You guys have all seen it, right? That, that's what it is, it's the diffraction pattern. So let's plot it. And then these things get smaller. It's symmetric, I'm having trouble plotting it. Okay, it's like a diffraction pattern. Because remember that the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero is what? What's the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero? Tell me. It one. Yeah, good. That's right. Okay, so so what we have is that we have this big, <clears throat> um, we, we have this maximum here. And so we see that that p m of t uh, is a, is a max when e m equals what neutral energy when e m equals what say it again e k e f k Exactly. So that's final state energy. And that's initial energy. Initial state energy. And so finally, we get something that kind of reminds us a little bit of energy conservation. Yay. <laughs> Somebody was asking about energy earlier. Okay, so this is about as good as you'll get for energy conservation and time dependent perturbation theory. There, there are some problems, there's some complications with energy that I'll sort of allude to. Uh, but this, I just want you to see that the maximum, pro it, so basically it's saying that you have, the maximum probability is to have transitions between degenerate states. And that should be very intuitive. It's basically saying that, it's like saying that, you know, here's some system where, Suppose that this is my energy level scheme. You know, I have all these energy levels. I have some degenerate states here and some other states. I have this complicated energy level. Suppose I start right here. That's my kth state. And then you say, well, what's my probability to go here and to go here and to go here and to go here or to go here? What's my probability to go to all these different final states? Well, it makes kind of intuitive sense that the highest probability should be to go sideways, to go to an energy conserving state, right? And, and the lowest probability should be going to go to a, a state that's very far away in energy. All right, do you guys see that sort of intuitively? But now I'm gonna ask you a question and this is sort of the, 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 sort of the question that kind of blows your mind a little bit. How is it possible for me to go to these other states that are not conserving energy? Because look at this formula right here. This formula is telling me that I have a probability to go to every single state. So I'm starting here in some arbitrary state, the kth state, that's my initial state. But this formula is telling me that I have a probability to go way, way, way up here to this very high energy state. And if you think about it, it, it it's a finite probability. It's, I just plug it into this formula. Do you see what I'm saying? So the formula is telling me that I have a probability to be excited to a very high state. And, and, and that is actually sort of non, in a sense, in a way it's sort of nonsensical because it means that it's like, it sort of means like I could take an atom and I could just give it a little kick 
And then I have a probability that this, that the electron and the atom has the energy of the sun, right? Because one of the excited states of an electron is equal to the energy of the sun. It is. It's a very, very high energy state, <laughs> but it is. It could be. It means like that the, the elect I could give the electron so much energy that it has the energy of the whole sun. And so that's a possible state of the electron in a hydrogen. Atom. It would be like a very, you know, very big Rydberg state, you know, way, way out. But I'm just saying that's a, that's possible. And so that makes kind of no sense intuitively, you know. But but now let me try to explain to you where that's coming from. The, the reason why we can be excited into all of these other states is because th this is why, because check it out. This is the way to think about it. This is my perturbation. I turn it on at T equals zero, it goes on. Then it goes a while and then it stops. And then I do, a, let's say I do the measurement at T equals time T. Uh, I should maybe I should call it T prime. Okay, I, I start at t equals zero and then I stop at time t and then I do the measurement, okay? Now, what is, and, and but notice that this is my perturbation. My perturbation is equal to a square wave. And so that means that my h prime, even though my h prime is a constant, it actually has time dependence because it's a square wave. I turned it on and I turned it off. And so that means that it, it has time dependence. So that means that I can write it as a frequency. That means it has power. Uh, I can write it like this, uh, S of omega, the power spectrum. The power spectrum is just equal to the Fourier transform. Okay, that's what power spectrum is. So that means that uh, zero, and then this is omega. So what is the Fourier transform of a square wave? Well, uh, the Fourier transform is gonna be uh, this. What a coincidence. It looks like this. It's the sink function. That's That sink function it's sort of like, it kind of looks like sine x over x or, you know, sine squared x over x. It's, it looks like that. It's the, it's the, diffra the diffraction, the diffraction pattern comes from the Fourier transform of, squ of the square wave. And so now you can sort of see where all those transition probabilities kind of came from. They came from the fact that I have all these Fourier components in that square wave. And so even though Naively, you would think that you only have this much energy, you know, the Hamiltonian, right? The energy is just this much. Uh, you actually have a lot more energy in that square wave if you do a Fourier transform. It has to have, there are very high frequency components in the square wave because if you do a Fourier transform, the fact that it has a, a square at these corners, whenever you have corners, then you, that gives you very high frequencies. And so you have very high frequencies living in your square wave. And that's why you have probability to be excited to all of these higher energy states. So that's what I want you to chew on and think about. And that's all living inside of the math. So it's kind of cute. It's interesting and it's real. Uh, okay, folks, that's, uh, I think that's all for uh, today. Um, we have to stop now. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, this is a good time to stop. Okay, bye-bye.